Writer, author, and media correspondent, Mary H.K. Choi turned a chance internship at a graffiti magazine into a career of influential bylines, boundary-pushing comic book stories, and eventually, many, many book deals. This is her blueprint. So you grew up in South Korea and in Hong Kong and moved to San Antonio as a child. How jarring was that transition? It was really, really crazy. I grew up predominantly in Hong Kong. I was born in Korea, but I moved to Hong Kong when I was 11 months old. And this was when it was still a British Crown colony. It was very much a commercial hub. But I knew that we would have to leave because in 1997, Hong Kong would go back to China from British Crown rule. And because we were Korean and because I wanted to go to college somewhere else, my family was just like, let's go to America. So we're like, cool. In my mind, I'm thinking Hong Kong too. I would have done like a New York. I would have done like a Los Angeles. My parents were like, San Antonio. But the nice thing about Texas is that there was nothing to do. And that's when I started reading. And I would read a book a day. In what genres? all genres, like Greek mythology, a lot of Norse mythology. Um, I was reading a lot about like just Grimm's fairy tales, like all the, wow, I'm such a nerd apparently, a lot of YA. So as you're thinking about colleges, mm -hmm. were there any other schools outside of um, UT at Austin that were sort of on your radar? My parents were like, yo, we moved to America so you could go to college here. We're in Texas. There's a very affordable in-state school that you can go to that's good. And literally in Texas, by law, if you're in the top 10% of your class, you, you just like automatically get into UT. It was the only um, entrance application and essay that I did. It was the only one. So you go to UT. What are you specializing in? What is your, your you know? sort of center of study. I was just like, I want to be in fashion. Except because I'm so pragmatic and because I'm so Asian and such an immigrant, I was like, even if I want to be in fashion, I don't think I am ballsy enough to be a designer. So I want to major in textiles and apparel with a focus on merchandising. So that's what I did. I moved to New York. I packed two suitcases. I had $6,000 from selling my Honda Civic. And that was all I had. And I moved to New York without telling my parents. I knew that I was gonna be on the Saks Fifth Avenue corporate program. That's where I'd done my internship. I had worked at Armani Collezioni on the second floor of Saks. And so I was just like, this is safe. This is cool. How does one get from working at Saks to applying to an indie graffiti, hip hop, you know, downtown lifestyle magazine? I was hitting refresh on every tab for any magazine internship. And the reason why Mass Appeal was so attractive to me, it was because it was the only place that would take me. At the point that I walked into Mass Appeal and I was wearing a Calvin Klein suit with an attache case and Prada heels, and I walked and in. And discover that the editor-in-chief is also 22 years old and wearing a fat farm sweatshirt um, or no, it was velour tracksuit. Velour tracksuit. Yes. The pale gray velour tracksuit. And we talked, I think, solely about interests at that point. And you seemed so dubious that I would want a job at a graffiti slash hip hop magazine. My goal at that moment was simply to show you that my intellectual curiosity would fill in any gap and that my lear learning curve would be quick. The first day, I, two things happened. One, I was asked to do all the research for an Air Force One 20th anniversary package, and I was responsible for all the facts on that. And two, I got the opportunity to write a book review. And I had never written a thing in my life. And seeing my name in print, but also not seeing my name in print, for the Air Force One story was really interesting because it gave me an appreciation for the fact that like sometimes you get credit and sometimes you don't and that's how magazines work and that's okay. After about a year though, 
the time at Massapeel comes to an end mm. and you end up working at Double XL as an editorial assistant and eventually as uh, the associate managing editor there. Mm -hmm. What was the adjustment from working at this indie startup to now, you know, a part of Harris Publications? Elliot Wilson needed an assistant. This was during, I would say, peak YN days. <laughs> um, and so Elliot had sort of mastered that sort of like comment type dialogue of the double XL re reader and basically just like would chum the waters with everything on double XL to where a lot of people in New York in these like hip hop concentrated areas wanted it the second it was out. And I always remember thinking how amazing it was that he was able to create that kind of immediacy and like urgency in buying the next issue in a monthly magazine. And so that kind of blew my mind. Over the course of time, you started getting bylines um, with increasing frequency throughout the magazine. Was that a pointed ambition of yours or were you just sort of filling in gaps? What happened was Vanessa Satin gave me the job of writing the plus one column. And that was a column about like industry insiders and interviewing just like everyone from like managers to like publicity people and things like that. But it didn't leave a lot of room for voice. You can't work for Elliot Wilson and be under the spell of his editorials, like his editor's letters, and not dream about like one day being able to write with that much like unfettered freedom. Like, what were you imagining the next step of your career to be after that? I did not have a lot of designs on what my next step would be. What happened actually was Mass Appeal was launching a girls magazine. And they were like, you should do it. And so that wound up being Misbehave. And Misbehave I launched while working at Double XL. And every girls magazine, I was like, who is this for? And it was almost like this like weird like robot lady idea that like a bunch of like white male advertisers and corner offices had concocted. And I was just like, th this is so bunk to me. Like it's just advertising. And so I wanted to create a magazine that talked to girls who I knew who were smart. And if they were really smart, they would go to Barnes and Nobles, not even buy the magazine and just read it and then leave. I was just like, that's who I want. How did you think like strategically about if I'm going to create this magazine and aim it at this demo that is underserved, how do I make them sort of, how do I ingratiate this product to them? The first issue came together as a product of Steven Victor being a magician and delivering me Nelly Furtado, who at the time was a bigger star than I should have ever gotten for a premiere issue, and writers and journalists who I really admired. But I was doing it in a really sort of like bizarre way where I would email a writer for a men's magazine that I really admired in England knowing that he'd been an editorial assistant for maybe too long. Like, your man was a little bitter, right? And I was like, I knew that if I knew everything about this person's of and matched them up with a subject that they could be excited about, they would do it for me for free. And the other thing that was really, really great about it is finally I had a place to sound exactly what my internal monologue sounded like and just build an entire house based on that. Choi's time at Misbehave came with highs and lows, but as the media landscape changed around her, she refocused on her singular writing voice. What was that transition like from being, you know, a behind the scenes player at a magazine where you sort of sit on the periphery of the potential readership <laughs> to now being, you know, the face of this new product? So I would physically fly myself out of pocket to LA and just post up in different conference rooms of any publicity place that would let me in the door. And my whole peg was this. Girls magazines want A-list girls. Men's magazines want C-list girls who get naked. I want C-list girls who are messy to talk about whatever they want and they can keep their clothes on. And so for Misbehave, the cover artists were people like Mina Suvari, Lily Allen, Amy Winehouse. Um, these were the people that we had in the magazine because I was just like, 
these are the people who I want to talk to and it's this predilection of girl that I want to be our audience. Actually, Amy Winehouse is a funny story in that it's the saddest story ever. When we did her shoot and Amy wouldn't let you touch her hair, wouldn't let you touch her makeup, she wouldn't get out of the bathroom. When she did get out of the bathroom, she couldn't stand, so we'd put her on a stool. But the stool, she kept slipping off the stool and she kept shaking. The, but the, the photo of her that became the opening spread of just her standing, looking off to a corner, and just being so far away. And she has, she's covered in bruises and scratches and what may have been track marks. And I remember thinking, okay, we're misbehave. We're on issue number two. I think one of the most important editorial decisions I can make right now in this moment is to not retouch her at all. That was kind of like the level of honesty that I wanted. Mm -mm. Another very typical cover line. Vegans and 23 other dudes we won't shag. Kelly Bundy style icon. Also an ode to how Pat Kiernan from New York One is a DILF. Um, so yeah, it was all very sort of mischievous and irreverent and like bright and largely done a lot of the time for free, so that was not easy to accomplish. So then you go and start working at Misbehave full time. Mm -hmm. And now, again, go from being sort of a, a middle cog in a large machine to being the leader of a small team. What was that transition like? Being the leader of a small team for a girls magazine designed for messy girls and um, girls who took up a lot of space was emotionally something I was not prepared for. I had girls show up to the office being like, you said that moving to New York was the most important part. Well, I'm here. And I'm just like, what do I do with you? Did you expect that I would give you a job? They're like, yes. And I'm like, did you expect me to pay you for this job? Because I cannot. And they were like, oh? There was one day at Misbehave, I remember, where not only was everyone strangely stoned, but that day, one of the interns dogs had gotten loose and I was just like first of all I was like why is there a dog here and it was a tiny yippy yippy dog and it raced past us and everyone was laughing until it raced off the roof and onto the ground <laughs> like many stories and I was like this is not an office and then I was like this is probably my fault Misbehave was really valuable in that I learned that a little bit of office culture is good for any office, no matter how much of a pirate ship you are. And I'm not a good leader. I am not a good boss. And I have never attempted to repeat that mistake at any other juncture of my career. So how did you come to terms with walking away from Misbehave? I walked away from Misbehave because I was burnt out. Like, I was physically sick and Giant Magazine reached out to me and needed a features editor. And I was like, features? Great. You mean just the middle of the book? Like, I don't have to do anything. Like, I don't have to do payroll. I don't have to, like, send issues. I don't have to carry magazines around. Fine, I will do that for this many dollars that you're gonna pay me? Incredible. So I left Misbehave and I worked at Giant and it was really great. And I was Googling private Pilates courses because suddenly I had so much money. And that's when I was fired. Not for Googling Pilates classes, but because <laughs> everyone was being laid off. Media at the time was bananas. And I would go to the unemployment office and I would see so many people I knew. And that's a feeling that you don't really forget. Within six or eight months, you really started getting your writing career off the ground. How did you transition your thinking to making yourself the brand? At the time, I was doing a lot of short stints, but I also started blogging for a website called The All. And The All was really interesting because it was run by two former Gawker editors. And that was the first time that white people read my writing. Through The All, I got the opportunity to write for a little publication called the New York Times. And I did four 
op-ed essays for the opinion desk. And I remember writing that and thinking, okay, so this is what people will finally see. And this is the voice I will be introducing myself as to a lot of people and what I will probably be remembered for. That is when all the magazines started calling. And that's when I started being able to be the brand the way I liked, which was completely unseen, just by voice. For several years, you continue doing these sort of short form, mm -hmm. first person accounts. And then you get a break into comic books. Mm -hmm. So I had known a bunch of comic book people. I'd been going to Comic Con in San Diego since way before it is what it is now. Um, and I knew a lot of these editors. Like I was friends with C.B. Cebulski and Axel Alonso, and I'd met Joe Casada a couple times. And so apropos of those New York Times pieces, my name came up in a development meeting just with a bunch of editors through someone I didn't know to where the person I did know was like, huh, and reached out and was like, would you ever write a comic book? And I was like, yeah. And so then the first comic book I did was Lady Deadpool, issue number one. And it was a 22 page, just standalone. And it was the greatest experience ever. Because a lot of the questions I was asking was like, can I impregnate her? And they were like, what? Sure, for continuity, no, but it's fine. I was like, can I kill her? And they're like, well, you can't really kill her. You know, think about the Weapons X program, blah, blah, blah. Because it was a spinoff and they were doing a lot of Deadpools at the time, like kid pool, dog pool, all of this stuff, there, I could get away with more. Like it wasn't anything that would affect the Marvel U at large. But yeah, this was super, super fun and a huge exercise with getting away with a lot. How did you wrap your mind around not only the format, but just fiction in general? Fiction is really hard, but the really lovely and beautiful thing about comic book writing, and the thing that I'm so grateful for in terms of it being my very first foray into fiction, was the math has to line up. You've got 22 pages, a three-act structure. You can only have so many boxes per page. You can only have so many speech bubbles in each box. And so that gives you an economy with which to have to, have to work. As a result of that, it sort of solves something that is a huge problem with people who usually write magazines to going into fiction, which is that whole show don't tell. Mm -hmm. You can't tell as much as you want ever. And showing is the most beautiful and elegant solution to a lot of the story problems. So just show. That's when I got into television. And I was just like, magazines, first love. The love I will never, ever give up. But I also need to know how to do video. I need to know how to do news. I need to know how to do live video. Now, how did you wrap your head around literally putting your face out, you know, on video? The one thing that I figured out way too late is that for every TV appearance or every sort of video appearance that you have, it just makes the imprint that much bigger. And so I had to accept that. I was just like, I have to accept the fact that the pound of flesh that you give the audience or the reader or whoever, it just becomes a currency that translates into like more people reading your stuff. You say pound of flesh, what's the cost to you? There's a hallowed area in me that all the writing comes from, and it's a garden that I tend very closely, and I don't want it to become adulterated with too much of this like back and forth transactive nature with the people that you write for. It's really, really easy and really seductive to get caught up in the current of needing that sort of positive reinforcement so constantly. So like, I was very reluctant to put myself on camera, but at a certain point I could no longer accept that video wasn't the future. And part of controlling a certain aspect of that was putting myself in front of the video. And that's when I decided I would do not only Viacom with MTV stuff, but even the career I have now, which is that I moonlight for Vice News Tonight on HBO as a culture correspondent. That is in keeping with the fact that I've fallen in love 
with storytelling forms that have disintegrated, that I really want to cover as many bases as possible. And that means having some mastery of as many conduits as possible. How do you balance, though, the part of you that is actually creating art versus the amount of time that you dedicate documenting other people creating art? No lesson was more sort of vivid than when I wrote DJ Khaled's book. People were like, this business book writes itself. It's like major key after major key after another one, lion, all of it, right? There was a point at which I realized when I was staying the St. Regis at Val Harbor, that's where he put me up, right? And I was like, oh my God, I've arrived. I'm finally like, you know, the, the official biographer of this person. And like, this hotel room is so nice. I might take a bath. It's like so great. He just ignored me for three days. But there was just a point at which I was just like, timeline wise, I'm not gonna get this book. And if I don't get this book, that's on me. The one thing DJ Khaled had that is very specific to him at this point was that he didn't fly. And I knew he was getting on a tour bus. And I knew that he was driving to Atlanta and then driving to California. And that's a lot of time. So I was like, bet, I gotta get on the bus. And a lot of businesses lessons I was just learning by watching him. I don't know. I mean, like, I understand if you would want the secret to success to be something really elaborate, some sort of elegant algorithm with like a lot of points and like, you know, that's really hard to replicate. But what I saw was the purest distillation of success, which is do not be afraid to make demands for things, but also be relentless about being delivered your goods. And for an immigrant and Asian female, I was like, oh my God, I have to be more like DJ Khaled. I also learned not to renegotiate how much money you should get based on like pain threshold and inconvenience before you've de delivered your book. Because he actually called me and gave me a special personal key. And he's just like, are you an artist? And I was like, man, this feels like a trick question. I'm like, yes, I'm an artist. He's like, are you the best? artists and don't tell me you're not because there's no way I would have hired not the best artist to work <laughs> with and I was like all right let's go I am the best artist he's like art is like a really unpredictable thing and it's a magic thing and when people come together as artists to create art you never know what's gonna happen so why would you bring in a conversation about money that is something that artists shouldn't have to worry about in the moment that they're creating art together at the worst possible time. Like don't try to exert control over something that is just like naturally uncontrollable. And don't introduce something as terrestrial and basic and like for other people to worry about and argue on your behalf about like money when you're supposed to be creating art together. After helping DJ Khaled realize his vision, Choi now looks ahead at the launch of her debut novel and a future as a career author. So this is the cover of my book, Emergency Contact. I knew that I wanted um, this kind of pink, aka millennial pink, um, that is a very sort of specific color to calibrate. And I had the pleasure of working with Simon & Schuster's art department, and they were amazing. And they came up with this idea of having the characters facing away from each other, which just perfectly encapsulates the book. So take me back to the process of putting together this first book. I had written a book, I had written this book and finished it. And I showed it to my agent at the time and he didn't love it. And he said to me, this is cool on some singer songwriter shit, but I want you to write a Katy Perry anthem. Now I dislike Katy Perry a lot. And in that moment I was like, this is not the place for me. So there was another agent who hit me up clear out of the blue a couple weeks later. And he was just like, I'm a huge fan of yours. I've read everything. Would you ever write a book? And I said, actually, I have a book. He's like, why is there a manuscript of yours that is just living in a drawer? Can I read it? And I was like, yes. He read it overnight. And he said to me, I can sell this. And actually started a bidding war. How did you sort of place yourself in that world to create these characters and 
flesh out, you know, this, this sort of imagined world. The way I've been lucky in my career is that I've always put myself in a position of being able to learn on someone else's dime. And with that, I wrote for Wired Magazine an article on the texting and social media behavior patterns of teens. And so I embedded with a bunch of teens all over the country, and we casted that for a while too. And I just hung out in their bedrooms. And I learned that they're not that different. Like, they, all the crises are exactly the same. It's like who they have a crush on, whether or not their parents understand them, if their parents' divorce is weighing on them in a certain way. And that really informed the kernel of what became my book. It's about texting and about how, no matter how noisy the world is, and no matter how many sort of like little tendrils there are of communication, that it is possible to feel totally alone. How did you even approach putting together something that big? Is this a system of note cards or like, are you just plowing through it one page at a time? I learned how to write a book from a YouTube tutorial that teaches you how to break up a three act structure into 27 chapters. Don't overthink it. Human beings like certain rhythms. It's like the hook on a song. Like, why would you be like, no, I find this totally craven to do a hook on a song. Like, I do not kowtow. It's like, no, people like a story that goes like this. That's it. So all I did was follow the directions of this YouTube link, which is pretty generic, of how to do that. And then I wrote that into a book. What does success look like? I never thought I had the right to write fiction. Like, I'm not trained in it. I have a degree in textiles and apparel. But waiting for permission was just the wrong move. You just had to write it and have enough faith in your faculties to know that you can get to the end of something like a book, finish it, and then show it to people and see what happens and trust that it'll find its audience. And success for that would be is if people don't hate it because this is the book I wanted to write. When you think about your career and, and your aspirations and amb ambitions, what does money mean to you? If I didn't work a day in my life with what I have in my account and what my current burn rate is, but I didn't make a dime, I'm good for three years. I can write stories that don't have to be informed by how someone will pay me for them for three years. I cannot imagine a place from which to create from that is more free, just like fully liberated, and also weird. Money is important to me because money means freedom. That's what money means to me. Do you feel like, you know, having dabbled in comic books, written short form, now done long form fiction, is this the format that you want to stay in as you move forward? I know I'm gonna write books until I die. That's really important to me. I, I respect it so much, I love it. I want to direct before I die. And I think that like writing and learning what things look like as you write it down and like framing and even comic books and all this stuff is sort of feed, feeding towards that. And I want, it's so dumb, but I really want an Eisner. Okay. So I know I will do comic books again in whatever form it takes. Like this is the space I will be in. And I think that that's gonna be the focus. And I think I'm gonna be interested in that for a long time. It's funny, like you get older and like all of the sort of airport book maxims start actually making sense to you. Not like the gift or whatever, but like there's like a Warren Buffett quote about like prioritizing, right? You make two lists. It's 25 things that you wanna do with your life before you die. You take the five most important, put them on one list. The rest of the 20 go on another list. And as the story goes, you know, you'd think like naturally that you would focus on these five, but then dabble in these other 20 when you have time. But it's not, it's that to do five, you must ignore the 20, no matter how good you are at it, no matter how seductive it is, no matter how much money it will make you. 
Because if you are to do the five before you die, that's what it's going to take.